Greetings and welcome to Theology Thursdays. We begin a new study of our book for this particular semester, which is going to be over the theology of prayer. We are going to talk about the theology of prayer through the lens of perhaps someone who is an expert in constant daily prayer. The book we are going to be using is Sister Joan Chittister's book, The Rule of St. Benedict, Spirituality for the 21st Century. And in order to understand what exactly we're going to be doing in this book, there are a couple of things that are helpful to understand about Sister Joan. So first of all, Sister Joan Chittister is a lifelong Benedictine nun of Erie, Pennsylvania. She and her sisters of the Benedictines have been at work and at prayer at this particular monastery for a number of years. And Sister Joan, as a part of the Order of St. Benedict, is a, I think, a particularly good person to have teach us about what it means to be at prayer. Because, as what might become obvious as we go throughout this book, Benedictines have a particular kind of spirituality of prayer. And uh, for those of you who are more practically minded, this is going to be the book for you. This is going to be a book in which the utter practicality of the rule of St. Benedict will become not only a ground by which you can ground yourself in, but also a one in which we can read again and again and be able to find some very important insights for our current age, even though the rule was written over 1,500 years ago. What exactly does Benedictine life look like? And why exactly is that important for how we enter into this book? Well, the first thing we need to understand about Benedictines is that something that is unique to Benedictines is the principle or the value of stability. We are able to withstand the changes and chances of life and still maintain some sense of groundedness. And for Benedictines, that is subsumed in the rule of St. Benedict. Now, the rule of St. Benedict was written for a specific kind of people, for a specific kind of spirituality. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, former uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, writes over his commentary on St. Benedict that holiness for St. Benedict, as opposed to perhaps the more flamboyant idea of holiness, um, of going and, you know, uh, living a holy life of miraculous sorts of ways. Holiness for St. Benedict, as Rowan Williams most uh, colorfully said, is sitting next to the same person in the same pew and saying your prayers for the next 40 years of your life. There is an utter mundaneness to holiness. And for St. Benedict, an utter practicality of holiness. For St. Benedict, one does not have to be an exceptional person in order to maintain a progress in holiness, to slowly work one's way into the holiness of God. It is not something that requires someone to have an astute theological mind. In fact, it doesn't require one to have much of um, an ability at the beginning to be able to assert um, theological truths at all. Rather, what the rule of St. Benedict, and likewise Benedictine spirituality, thrives upon is regular order, regular rule. And in fact, the uh, Latin term that we get the word rule from is the word regula. The regular observance of the prayers, of the work, the everyday sitting with the same person for the next 40 years of your life and slowly moving into the holiness of God in the process. What should be obvious is that another thing about Benedictines is that they 
are primarily interested in long-term holiness. Not in short-term, not in immediate, not in um, amazing conversion experiences, although we might have those along the way, but rather it's all about the everyday order. It's all about the putting on your shoes in the morning, making your bed in the morning, saying your prayers in the morning, doing your work in the morning, and going on and doing so throughout the rest of the day, dotted and reminded every couple of hours of the prayers of which we are offering unto God through both what we are praying in the chapel and what we are doing around our house or our work, or for the Benedictine sisters around the cloister. Now, Sister Joan is also a prolific writer. So she is no, um, she is no novice as it comes to being able to write very astute theology. In fact, there are other volumes that you can find of her. She's written over 40 books, by the way. There are many other volumes that you can find where she does some intensely important theology. But this book right here is a little bit of a change of pace for us in Theology Thursday because this is written primarily as a devotional book. It's meant to be short little snippets, short little reflections. Because the theology of prayer, especially for Benedictines, arises out of a particular tradition of spirituality and not just any one. If you think about the uh, uh, systems that we've talked about so far, such as sacramental theology with Andrew Davison, and such as biblical studies in New Testament with N.T. Wright, we are coming from a academic background that is looking at some broader theological things. However, when we're talking about St. Benedict, we are talking about a particular tradition of Christianity that is sometimes called the wisdom tradition of Christianity. The wisdom tradition is primarily concerned with practical, everyday, wise living. It's not as interested in the broader theological import of some more kind of systematic work, but rather the wisdom tradition is lived theology. It is a theology in which we are embodying by what we are doing. And as it comes from the wisdom tradition, when we are living out our prayer life, we are actually attesting to theological truths about our prayer life. We are obviously saying that prayer is important if we make a rule for ourselves to say our prayers every morning, afternoon, and evening. We are doing something that, uh, to be completely honest, is very countercultural in our sort of materialistic, entertainment-driven culture when you could be doing something more entertaining. And St. Benedict instead urges you to do something utterly not entertaining, because that, for St. Benedict, is how you grow in holiness. Not in self-improvement. This is not what this book is. It's not about self-improvement. It is about improvement in the spiritual sense, which is not necessarily self-improvement or self-help. It involves perhaps some of those things. It perhaps involves some of the psychology involved in that, but that's not the purpose of the rule. The rule is for us to be able to live a regular life of prayer. Well, it's helpful to kind of understand those things before we start, because uh, we need to have a good uh, grounding in what to expect as we get into this book. But as it comes to Sister Joan's own words, I I'd like to let her stand on her own here, because she tells us pretty directly why this book was written in the first place, and I think there's some really important things that we can glean from it. When we think about the technology that we, in fact, are using right at this moment to view this video. What is something that we can say for sure about the enduring aspects of the TV, the smartphone, the tablet, whatever device that you are using? What can we say for sure is enduring about that technology of which we are using right at this moment? 
In a broader treatment of this, can you think of anything in your life that has all of a sudden become expendable or defunct in some ways, and you have had to buy a newer version of it in order to keep up with the infrastructure of the time? To be completely honest, uh, one of the ways in which this is most obvious is in the technology industry. Do you remember Apple iPods? A completely digital way of storing one's music on a small device um, that can fit inside your pocket? Well, guess what? iPods are no longer made, even though the first iPod debuted on the scene in the early 2000s. And that is only, only a mere 20 years ago. And yet, something that for the first time was made that was, that was um, a complete sea change in the way that we understand technology functioning, now is obsolete. You actually can't find um, infrastructure that supports the old software of these old iPods because newer and better things have come out since then. In fact, uh, most of you probably have access to music just through your streaming on your mobile devices that completely makes iPods obsolete. Our iPods have condensed into our phones, so to speak, um, and such is the way in which we listen to music, watch video, things like that. But remember the time when we thought that even the concept of being able to watch television was just something so new and, and novel that it was the sign of the change of the ages? Well, guess what? Motion pictures have only existed for maybe 130 years. We, uh, if you look at the history of film, uh, motion pictures um, uh, or picture shows, um, movies as they came to be known, a lot of the early moving picture shows were simply cameras set up in regular places. People moving um, on the other side of the world through China, uh, Chinese marketplaces and being brought over to the Western world as some sort of amazing peer into a place that we've never been before. People would pay money to go watch people walk down the street because of the technology of the movie was so amazing. And yet, now we don't, we no longer actually use physical film for a lot of things. Instead, we use digital software in order to take video and things like that. You know, thank goodness we don't have to, you know, stuff little reels into um, our uh, video devices in order to produce videos like this. I simply have to, you know, look at our camera that is set up right there um, and just talk into it without having to worry about film. But this speaks to something that is also so deeply a part of our Western culture that Sister Joan talks about very pointedly, which is that we have so changed from the ways in which culture usually understands itself because of, in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, we have perhaps ascribed ourselves to this myth of progress. Things are getting better, things are changing constantly, and whenever we ascribe to that, what can we hold on to that endures? Uh, Sister Joan even talks about um, architecture, it used to be, especially if you go over to Europe or if you go to other places in the world, architecture was built to withstand the test of time, to exist for longer than the architect or builder lives, to far outlive cultures even. Think of the great pyramids of Egypt and things like that. They were not built to be thrown away. They were built to endure the test of time, presumably in perpetuity. But how has that changed? Think about the ways in which automobiles are sold. There is, as we would refer to, there is a planned obsolescence to the way in which we deal with the manufacturing of the world. The technology, cars, 
you know, video games, video game consoles, cameras, even houses are built for planned obsolescence. They are built to only exist for a certain time period and be discarded afterwards or deconstructed and recycled. And in so doing, that has fundamentally changed how we understand the stability of what endures. If we were to think about what are the things that are enduring in our lives, we have to sort of get outside of our culture, even. We have to ask ourselves, what are the fundamental realities of the world? What are the ways in which the world functions that don't change, that are constant, so to speak? But th this speaks to a completely fundamental question of which this book is written in um, response to. That the ways in which we live our lives in and of themselves contain within it, or within the ways in which we live, fundamental confessions of what we think are enduring things of life. The funny thing is that we have so become a consumerist, materialist culture that throws things away when they, when, whenever, uh, whenever we feel like it, that we have lost any sense of enduring reality. We can give ourselves up to kind of a bland um, hedonism of just doing what feels good in the moment, because this moment is all that we have. Or to quote um, a famous phrase from the ancient world, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That there is a sort of do what feels good at the moment, because who knows if we're going to make it to tomorrow. There is, maybe beneath the surface of our entertainment and flashy, smiley industry, perhaps there is a deep sense of nihilism, of... Uh, a belief in the meaninglessness of the world that creeps in, and so we try to mask it by all kinds of distractions. Well, Sister Joan, in the talking about the rule of St. Benedict, we are talking about a rule that existed at a particular point in time in a particular culture for a particular reason. That is true. However, the rule, being able to survive, the chances and times of the world, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the translation of languages, the translation of cultures, and yet still this rule has thousands of people who live under its rule every day, we have to ask ourselves, what about the rule is enduring? Well, the rule itself Again, as we talked about uh, just a little bit ago, the rule presupposes that mundane activity is in fact the path to holiness. It is not the flashy, the entertaining, the smiley, the toothed grins um, of feeling happy all the time. That's not what holiness looks like. Holiness looks like constant stability in the way that we actively live out our lives. Again, the wisdom tradition of Christianity. The early monastics, of which St. Benedict is one of them, go out to the desert. They leave society because what they're seeing in the changing Roman Empire, the legalization of Christianity um, as the religion of the empire, what these Christians these early monastic Christians are seeing is they are seeing a complete um, throwing away of the concept that one must be persecuted for their faith. But at the same time, there is a complete laxation. Uh, people no longer have to be serious, um, at least in the sense that one is serious about their Christianity under persecution. One no longer takes upon the name of oneself Christ with the fear of death. And for the monastics, this was the sign that the church was being co-opted. They left society completely to go to the desert. Well, 
the early monastics who decides to go to the desert all of a sudden start attracting um, hermitages of different people living solitary styles of very disciplined, ascetical prayer lives, and who are living out a wisdom of the lived life of prayer that they begin to attract followers. They attract other people who go to the desert to escape the life of the world in order to be there and thus devote themselves to a different kind of spirituality. A spirituality that involves regular observance, that involves deep asceticism and sacrifice of one's life before this, but of whom promises that if you adhere to the rule, that you will grow in holiness bit by bit. And so the wisdom tradition of Christianity, of which Sister Joan is so deeply um, formed by and deeply believes in, she says is a completely necessary and perhaps even a vital part of how we actually remain steadfast in the ways that we live our lives in the midst of this utterly turnover heavy changing planned obsolescent society. That in fact the adherence to the rule of Saint Benedict is an antidote to the ills that we experience through constant change and chance. That perhaps, as she would say um, pretty directly, this is a defense against meaninglessness. We are not simply doing what feels good at the moment. We are not simply um, being washed to and fro aimlessly. But rather, we are dedicating ourselves to a tried and true and holy method of living. Not just any method, but one in which doesn't simply improve ourselves, but also stabilizes our very society, grounds ourselves in timeless lived truths, and not merely the washing waves of fad and fancy. So when she talks about uh, the importance of this book, she has very clear in her mind that society is perhaps um, fraying from itself. We are questioning the very nature of whether there is a universal uh, rule at all, a universal um, truths, as especially we are in the clutches of relativism. Is there such thing as a universal truth? Is there such thing as justice for real, or is it just something that we make up ourselves? Is there really such a thing as objective love, or is it just uh, chemicals in our brain that sometimes we feel good whenever this happens, but there's nothing lasting about this? Or is there something deeper to reality? One of the things in which we readily might say is that the wisdom of generations past is those sorts of things that continuously are brought towards our minds as timeless ways of living. Whether you agree fully with the philosophy of Plato or Aristotle, we fundamentally are influenced by their philosophy of how to live life. But even philosophers throughout the world they were not just thinkers, they were not just scientists, they were not just moral thinkers, they were also deeply wisdom thinkers. There's no separation between the life of one's mind and the way one lives. That is a very modern concept. Arguably, that's that was brought on by the Enlightenment, where we kind of separated the uh, intellectual from the lived. Um, we can talk about that at some other point in time, but especially for someone like Sister Joan, who lives a wisdom, lives out a rule of wisdom, this is deeply important for her. So when we get into this book, as we will, we need to have in the front of our minds, she is not going to be throwing out 
necessarily intellectual concepts of which we are uh, making uh, intellectual sense to. Rather, she's asking us very pointedly to live out what we are reading. We're not being asked to sit idly by and say, oh, isn't this an interesting idea from the 5th century? What she's saying is that living out a rule such as the rule of St. Benedict is perhaps the way that we tether our society back together. In, in a more anthropological sense, this is what she believes to be an antidote to modernism, an antidote to this throwaway society. And as we get farther in this book, you will probably realize that has so much to say about the way that we treat people. Do we treat people as only serving my happiness, only serving my entertainment, and whenever they stop doing so, then they are not worth anything to me? This utilitarian use of people is what Sister Joan is going to talk about intensely when we get to those chapters on the rule of St. Benedict that have to do with how we live in a society. There are some fundamental things about the rule that are going to push intensely back against what we commonly might see as throwaway people in our society and might reveal to us that in Christ there is no such thing as obsolescent people. So it's a deeply counter-cultural way of living that this book is going to describe, but it is a practical way of living. To return to the concept that we talked about at the very beginning, St. Benedict was a practical theologian. He is, the way that you pray is by the most mundane fashions imaginable, by a set rule, certain psalms per day, certain psalms on this time, sitting your tail down in that pew next to the same person and saying your darn prayers. That, for St. Benedict, is how we grow in holiness. It's by a set, stable way of living. And I emphasize way of living. This is not merely an intellectual exercise. And so, as we get into this wonderful resource of the wisdom tradition, I encourage you, after each of our sessions during the week, make plans make schedules. <laughs> Benedict loved schedules, by the way. Uh, he, he was a, a type A personality that uh, loved making schedules. So, but really, make schedules. Plan on doing things. Set things into your lifestyle that you live out the wisdom of the Christian tradition. Because in so doing, Sister Joan is going to say, we are serving the preservation of our very culture. We are preserving those things that need to be preserved. Not to say that everything is in need of preservation all the time, but we are preserving perhaps the most important things. So as Sister Joan would say, this is an invitation, particularly to those who are beginners in this aspect. Um, novices is what we would call that within the uh, within the uh, the religious orders. But she very seriously is saying this book is for beginners. This is for those who are looking to begin a life of stable rule, a life of stability in the midst of all of the change of life, uh, an anchor in the midst of a storm of constant moving of the waves. So, Sister Joda invites you and me, and uh, all of those who might uh, find this video series into a serious, stable way of living. Because that in and of itself is a lived tradition of wisdom. And as we're going to discover over the next uh, several months, that lived tradition of wisdom is indeed itself theology of prayer.